Okay. Scripture reading will be from uh, the ninth chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 19. We'll read a little bit quicker this morning so we'll have some time to give a sermon. So you can give it up if you want. I'll take it over. It's interesting, there's no mention of a horse here that, uh, that Paul fell off. You may notice that when we get to that section. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. Someday, perhaps we need to do a study on the background of this man, Saul of Tarsus, his upbringing, uh, the fact that he studied at the feet of a doctorate within the law, in, within Gamaliel, and just how fervent he was in getting rid of this way, which we know to be Christianity. If we were able to interview Saul before, during, and after his road trip to Damascus, would he have changed very much? You ever believed in something so very strongly, only to have your mind change? The facts got in the way? What is that like to have to regroup, to have been so convinced of something and then to have the props knocked out, of, out from underneath you and then you have to change your mind? 
I think we have all been there to one degree or another at some point within our lives, believed in something that we might say in hindsight, you know, I really don't know why I was so convinced of that back then. And so, Saul, let me ask you a few questions as you head to Jerusalem on this road or from Jerusalem to Damascus. What is it that you are convinced of? What is it that you know about life? Just who are you as a man and where are you headed? Now, how would... Saul of Tarsus, beginning his journey on that road to Damascus from Jerusalem, answer those questions. He would say, I am a Jew, and I believe with all my heart in the law of Moses. And as a Jew and a student of the law, and perhaps even one that is becoming a teacher thereof of the law, he would have said, I am also a Pharisee. And we, as Pharisees, we believe in the law of Moses to the letter, that it ought to be practiced to the T. And I believe that anybody that goes against it ought to be punished. Oh, is that what you believe? Yes, and I am convinced. Well, do you know that you are right? Well, I know the scriptures. I know the law and the prophets. And I know that only through the law of Moses comes salvation. And only those who follow the law can be saved. Do you doubt that those would have been the Responses of Saul of Tarsus. What else do you know? What else are you sure of, Saul? What else are you convinced of? And he would say, well, there are those that are out there that are undermining the faith. Oh, really? Well, who are they? Oh, you know who they are. They're, they're the ones that call themselves the way. Now, we're in Acts chapter 9. We know that later on in Acts chapter 13 that they are called the Christians. But he probably wouldn't have known them by that at, at this standing. But, and so, you know, those guys that follow the way. There are those that out there that believe that the Messiah has come. Oh, yeah? Well, who's that? Well, you know who? Jesus. Well, Jesus. There's, there's a lot of Jesuses these days. Saul. What Jesus are you talking about? You know the Jesus that said that he was the Messiah. I don't believe that for a minute. And in fact, I believe that everyone that is convinced that he is the Messiah is not only wrong, but they are infidels, and that in doing so, they need to recant. Now, if you want to know how Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, took that to the max, you can turn to Acts chapter 26 and look at passages like 10 and 11. And from his own mouth... Paul details there the ways that he arrested, that he imprisoned, tortured, tried to get the recounting out of the mouths of those that were followers of Jesus of Nazareth and consented to their death. Is that true, Saul? Is that how strongly you believe? Yes, in fact, I have within my pocket right now letters from the high priest to say that I can go to Damascus and I can get more of the same. Would you like to have that guy as a travel companion? He does have some folks that are with him. I, I didn't see a horse in there either, Steve, as you were reading that. But yet I can't help but see him on a steed, almost in like a knight in shining armor. And boy, he's polished that armor that morning. He is, he is convicted. Saul, are you sure? Yes, I am committed to Judaism and to its leadership. I believe that only through the high priest comes the forgiveness of sins. And I am going to be the one that stamps out these false teachings. And I am on a mission to bring these followers of the way, these followers of Jesus, if it's within my power, to justice. And to wipe this silly false doctrine off the face of the earth. Because everybody that knows the law knows that this leads men to their doom and I am only helping them out. Now... I know I've done some supposition here, uh, but I don't think that I have done any injustice. Perhaps I've made him a little bit more vengeful than what he was. Perhaps I made him a little bit more fanatical than what he was. But it was at the feet of Saul of Tarsus that they laid their coats in just a few chapters earlier whenever they had stoned Stephen. And he does have letters within his pocket to bring back to imprison, to persecute, and to ultimately consent to the destruction of the Christians there in Jerusalem, those that are followers of Jesus. Are you in agreement, or do you have any conflict within your heart? Is your faith like his faith? And you say, no, what are you asking me? Do I believe in Jesus of Christ? You see, because G to Saul of Tarsus, Jesus, I believe in Jesus, that he came from Nazareth, right? I believe... In Jesus that he was crucified. You know the song, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. I mean, Saul could have agreed with both of those statements, couldn't he have? 
It's the next statement that he disagrees with. It's that next statement that he is against because these silly followers of Jesus not only believe in Christ, but they believe that he was resurrected from the dead. Can you believe that raising from the dead? Get real. Is he in for a surprise? And so as we read through those passages and he goes down the road to Damascus and as the men are with him, a bright light shines. And there are three accounts, actually, of this incident. In Acts chapter 9 is the incident in self. And then you have the recounting of the incident in Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 26. First, by the apostle Paul before the rabble that wants to tear him limb from limb in Acts chapter 22. And then before the governor of the land, Festus, and the king of the land, Agrippa, in Acts chapter 26. And so you have three different accounts all giving the same story, but you'll have a little bit difference. And so I'll be drawing from all three of these and we'll probably be saying something like the light shone at midday. And you might say, well, wait a minute. I didn't see that there in Acts chapter nine. Well, you'll have to read other other accounts and where it says that at midday, the light shone brightly. Okay, so here we are at midday and they're going down the road and that bright light shines upon them. And all of a sudden he falls down and a voice from heaven saw Saul, why are you persecuting me? Would that ruin your day? (laughs) I mean, you're on a mission. You've got a schedule. And all of a sudden, you are stopped in your tracks. You're blinded. And somehow now you're prostrate upon the ground. And the voice speaks to you. And it says that only Saul could understand what that voice said. Now, it also said that it spoke in Hebrew. And so maybe those others that are traveling with Saul don't speak Hebrew, but they did hear something. That's my best understanding of that. I think the simplest form is he is speaking in Hebrew. They don't speak Hebrew. So what does that say? That means that this message is for Saul and for Saul alone. And the question to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, comes his way. Now, don't get ahead of me here. Saul doesn't know who's talking to him. Saul doesn't understand even the premise of the question because his next response is, who art thou Lord, Lord, why is he calling this voice Lord? Notice he doesn't say Jesus. Notice he he doesn't say Christ, right? He simply says Lord. And as Paul lays there on the ground with that bright light shining around him, he responds to the question of Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his immediate response is one that already shows his heart. He didn't say, who are you? Simply, he didn't say, what do you want? He didn't say, leave me alone. He didn't say, I ain't got time for this. He didn't say, why are you interfering with official business? He didn't say, leave me alone and let me get on the road. What did he say? He says, who art thou, Lord? And already within Saul's mind, he has made a conclusion, and it's a pretty good one. (laughs) Blinding light on the road, voices from heaven, it must be God. And he has already transitioned into a frame of mind that says, whatever entity that I am dealing with, it has power over me. It has stopped me cold, and he's going to find out later, has left me blind, and I had best humble myself before a power such as that. What is going on within his mind? He has the power to prosecute. He has the power to imprison. Saul has the power to consent to the death of, and yet here he is groveling on the ground before a power that is greater than he, and he says, who art thou, Lord? Now, because he has made that transition so nimbly and so ably, humbling himself before this entity, whatever it is within his mind, he is now in a position to receive the instruction. All of those other answers that he could have given would have said, I I need more convincing. You know, I, I really don't think that you have the power. You can't tell me what to do. But with this first question, with Lord Who art thou? It's like, here I am, Lord. What would you have me do? And the voice answers, I am Jesus of Nazareth. What do you think he felt in that moment? What are those letters doing in your pocket, Saul? He could have said to him. What has the voice just declared? I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. I believe that the tomb was found empty. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Do you know what he has just said? I live, I am, I am the son of God. And all of a sudden, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Makes a whole lot of sense. All right, let's cut away. Let's get Saul in that interview chair and let's ask him a question. Saul, what do you think? You know, just what we have to go on right now. What do you know? Everything I believe has gone out the window. The veil to the holiest of holies 
has been torn all over again, but this one is within my heart. I really thought that Jesus was simply a man from Nazareth. He's God. What am I going to do? What have I done? Lord, have mercy on my soul. Saul, calm down. Calm down. Do you really feel that way? Well, how can I feel any other way? The God that I thought that I was pleasing, the God of the old law, the God that believes that every jot and tittle of that law is going to be fulfilled. And now you're telling me that it has been fulfilled. The Messiah has come. The Savior was here and I missed him. What am I to do? I not only did not accept him and didn't believe him and didn't follow him. I was killing those and consenting to the death of those who did. Why didn't he just strike me dead? I don't understand. I'm not worthy. You say, you can't know all that. You don't know that. Okay, what happens? As we read there, he knows. And Jesus says, get up, go into the city, and there it will be revealed unto you what you are to do. What are you going to do, Saul? Well, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go into the city, and I am going to pray, brother. I am going to pray because what is revealed to us is not only does he fast, he doesn't eat or drink anything for three days, but also... As he prays, Jesus speaks to Ananias. And what is that prayer? You think that Saul of Tarsus is praying? What kind of heart does he have? Has his question at least initially been answered to the degree of he knows who the Lord is? Who art thou, Lord? Yes, I am Jesus of Nazareth. And is there not now an indictment of everything that he stands for and believes and lives for? Yep. Wouldn't you pray too? And wouldn't that prayer be... Lord, please forgive me, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Now, I'm sure within the context of that prayer, there was the, I just didn't know. I just didn't realize. Lord, if, if I could have been one of your disciples, then I would have been. Lord, please don't destroy me. Lord, please give me another chance. Please, Lord, I always wanted to do what the God wanted me to do. He says that in Acts chapter 23 in verse 1. He says, as he looks at the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. In other words, I have always tried to do what God wanted me to do. And you say, then how in the world do you get a stall of Tarsus killing Christians if he has always lived in good conscience? Now, I can understand a criminal coming to the way of the Lord, and we know what he did was wrong, and he knows what he did was wrong, and he couldn't have, though, lived in good conscience. But how can a man persecute, beat, imprison Christians, try to get them to recant, and then consent to their destruction, say, as Saul of Tarsus, though he was then Paul the apostle, but even as Saul, that I could live in all good conscience before God unto this day because he was convinced that what he was doing was right. It wasn't a sham. This wasn't some ploy to pull the wool over the people's eyes in order that he might gain power. He honestly believed that Jesus was simply a man from Nazareth. He didn't believe anything other than his crucifixion, certainly not his resurrection. And as Saul of Tarsus, he never came to accept that he was the Messiah, the Christ. You see, just because you believe something doesn't make it so. Should I say that one again for emphasis? Just because you believe something does not make it so. What's the difference, Saul? How do you deny a blinding light? How do you deny a voice from heaven? How do you deny what you perceive to be God and is God saying, I am Jesus? How do you deny that he has been resurrected? And in fact, it is Paul who says in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus, the son of David by the flesh, verse 4, declared to be the son of God with power through the resurrection. That same man saying, I believe that the tomb was found empty. Not that the disciples stole his body, but he is the son of God with power. Okay, let's let Saul up from his interview chair. Let's let him get on down the road and get him praying. And in walks a man named Ananias. Now, Ananias is just the Greek version, his name of an Old Testament word, which is Hananias. Ananias is a representative of God. He didn't come willingly, though, did he? And in fact, whenever the Lord Jesus said, Ananias, I want you to go to a certain place. Jesus doesn't pull any punches, does he? He says, I want you to go to this address. I want you to go to Judas's house on a street called Straight, okay? I want you to find a street called Straight. I want you to go to Judas's house, and there you will find a man named Saul of Tarsus. <gasps> Can't you hear Ananias gasp? He's like, Lord, don't you know about this guy? You see, they didn't have CNN or Fox News interviews. Those are just a little bit of a game that we've been playing here this morning. The news hadn't got out yet. 
Ananias didn't know that Saul was accosted by God three days ago. Ananias didn't know that for three days until Jesus told him that Saul has been in a frame of mind to receive because Jesus said, get up and go into the city and it's going to be told to you what you are going to do. Ananias didn't know any of that. All he heard was Saul of Tarsus. Lord, don't you know about this guy? Isn't that a funny question for somebody to ask of God? Don't you, do you know about this guy and what he is up to? But what's in Ananias' mind? Lord, you're sending me to my death. I'm going to be like a sheep into the wolves. He wants to hear about you. No, he doesn't. He's wanting to kill us. And Jesus says to Ananias, and I think he might as well have said, Ananias, get a grip. I have got plans. And whether you realize it or not, this man is waiting for you to come. I have told him that you are on your way, and I've given him your name, and he knows you're coming, and he is ready to preach unto you that gospel. And by the way, Ananias, after he is converted, I've got more plans for him. And so as Saul waits for Ananias, he comes in and he puts his hand upon him and he receives his sight. And Ananias says to Saul, Saul, get up. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. And do you know what happens? He stands up (laughs) and he is baptized because of that promise that is given by Peter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We know that that means the forgiveness of sins for Saul of Tarsus. And he steps out of being a persecutor of Christians and into the role of a disciple of Christ. He ceases to be Saul of Tarsus and he becomes Paul the Apostle. Because you see, he's lived in all good conscience before God until this time. And what he did in the past, he didn't know any better. But now that Ananias has come, he has learned something. Well, he was already convinced that Jesus is the Lord. He already had faith about that. But now Ananias has said, salvation is yours. Would that prick your ears? You you can be forgiven. You can have mercy and grace upon you. It is here. It is at the door. All of my sins, every single one of my sins, can Saul not visualize the face of Stephen as he consented to the death of that young man? Now, that's against him in his conscience at this point. But I didn't know any better. Lord, I was acting in faith. I I didn't know. But he knows better now, doesn't he? He knows better now. You know what? See, Saul had the option to either continue as Saul of Tarsus with a guilty conscience because the gospel had been revealed, or he could keep a clear conscience and become the Apostle Paul. No longer a persecutor of Christians, but embracing them. No longer a persecutor of Jesus of Nazareth, but following him as the Christ, as the Messiah. No longer ardent for the law of Moses, but setting it aside because it has been fulfilled. No longer saying that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, but he was resurrected from the dead and he is a son of God with power. Have we benefited from the, bene- from the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? 13 letters, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and maybe Hebrews, 13, maybe 14 books, a man testifying, not redeeming himself, not doing penance, but a man in good conscience declaring, who art thou, Lord? I know who he is. He is the son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And let me tell you, because of what Jesus said to Ananias, not only is he going to hear the gospel from you as it is revealed, but I am going to show him how much he must suffer for my sake. I'm about to show him as a disciple of mine, everything that he has done to another Christian is going to come back upon him, not at the hands of those Christians, but because he now is one and the defactors are going or the dissenters will be coming after him. But he also says in the same process, he is going to be a light to those that are walking in darkness, that he is going to be a light to the Gentiles. He will stand before governors and kings and witness my name. He stood before his own people in Acts chapter 22. He stood before the governors and the kings in Acts chapter 26. He goes on three missionary journeys. He is arrested and then shipwrecked on the fourth, I would say, missionary journey on his way to Rome. He penned letters that were a gift of the Holy Spirit that we still have within the scriptures today. Do we benefit from the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? Okay, now it's your turn. You're in the chair. Okay, let's ask you a few questions. What do you know? What do you believe? Who are you living for? And what is your purpose? Is your conscience clear? Have you had your sins forgiven? Have you been washed in the blood? 
of Christ. O oh, heart bowed down with sorrow, O oh, eyes that long for sight, there is gladness in believing. In Jesus there is life. As we stand and as we sing. There's hope.